Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. church. How's everyone doing? We doing good today? Come on, it sounds good to me. Pastor Andy and Sharon have given me the opportunity to speak with you this weekend, and it's always an honor. I got a story in the Bible I want to read to you real fast, so you can look at it on your outlines or look at the screen. Ruth chapter 4, we're going to go to verses uh, 13 and jump to 17. Check this out. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, come on, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, I want you to remember that story, and we're going to go back to that a little bit later in the message, okay? But we have uh, been in a series, and we're coming to the conclusion of a series called Families Are Messy where we've been looking at messy families in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and all these messy families have definitely given us hope about our messy families because these families are jacked up. <laughs> I was like, man, there's some crazy stuff going on. So, so this, these stories have also demonstrated how God can even work in our mess, okay? So if you are taking notes or following along on your outline, or you can even live tweet to at Vineyard VA using our hashtag VCC Messy Fans. You can title this speech, Living in the World's Culture. Living in the World's Culture. Now today, we're going to look at one of the messiest families in the book of Genesis. We're going to look at the story of Lot and his family as they lived in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. Now if you're not sure what Sodom and Gomorrah is... The best way I can compare it to, to today is think of your, just think of your local Walmart, and that's kind of Sodom. That's what you got. You got Sodom and Gomorrah there, or maybe DMV. That may fit more of how it is, okay? See, Sodom and Gomorrah had a very wicked culture, and we're going to talk about culture. See, culture is a big deal. Culture is a set of values, our behaviors, that create an atmosphere. Everyone has a family culture, right? Some, some of them are kind of good. You got that crazy Uncle Louie that comes and makes the, makes the culture all crazy. See, you go to work, your workplace has a culture, your school has a culture. Culture is a way of regularly doing things. Now I have a question for you. Have you ever stepped into a culture that you just weren't ready for? That you're like, oh no, what did I sign myself up for? Now I have a story to go with that, okay? Now, a few years ago, Aaron, uh, Aaron and I, my wife, we were engaged a few years ago, and she invited me to come with her family to their yearly trip to Connecticut to visit her, their extended family up there. And so I was like, uh, yeah, of course, I'm down. I'm about to join the family. I got to meet the grandparents. I got to meet her older sisters. I'm down. This sounds good, okay? So normally when they do this trip, they stop in Connecticut. Then they go to that beach house in Maine. Not this time. This time, we're hanging in Connecticut, okay? So, so Aaron and I, we drove about eight and a half hours through the night to get there. And then by the time we arrived in the morning, we were exhausted, man. We were just tired. So we get to her grandparents' house, walk into the house, and it was like I instantly stepped into a time machine. We're back in the 70s. I was like, wow, this is groovy, man. This is awesome. So I met her granddad. It was awesome. You know, I hugged and it was good. But I was tired. I was so tired. Have you ever been so tired that you can't even tell that you're tired? You're going like, you're going delirious how tired you are. That was the state of tiredness I was at, right? So I go into one of the rooms. I lay on the couch. I need to take a nap. 
you know. So I'm, I'm laying there, and I'm trying to go to sleep, and my body's exhausted, but my eyes won't, won't go to sleep. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about, that lack of sleep. And then all of a sudden, as I'm laying there and trying to go to sleep, I start to sweat. I start getting really sweaty. I'm like, man, it's hot in here. I was like, this house is hot. And then so now I'm in this weird place of, like, lack of sleep, feeling delirious. I'm hot. And then I see what I think is Aaron's granddad walking around the house in a white tee and some boxers on. And I'm like, where am I right now? Is this the Twilight Zone? Did I make it to Connecticut? It, what I discovered very fast after I woke up from my lack of sleep was that Aaron's grandparents, they have a culture, and it's called the no AC culture. <laughs> Their motto is no AC no big deal. No problem. They're good with it. So it's in the middle of August, and it's hot, man. I'm talking about I've been to Mexico several times on missions trips. It was hotter in that house the whole week we were there than me playing when soccer in the sun with kids in Mexico. It was that hot. So I feel like the majority of the trip with a fan into my face, like, mm, help me, Lord. And then I had to um, share a bed with my future brother-in-law, and me and him at night, we're trying to sleep, and we're moving around, and our skin is peeling off the mattress. I'm like, yeah, this is crazy right now. So it was hot, man. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for the no AC culture. But here's the thing. Everyone else was good with it. Everyone else was fine. They're like, what's wrong with you, man? I'm like, I'm hot, you know? See, culture sets the course of the way we live. But the funny part, by the end of the week, man, I was kind of like, this no AC thing, it's kind of nice. I kind of want to walk around in a white tee and my box is on too. He got something good going here right now. This is good, <laughs> watching TV. See, now what happens though, for real, what happens when we are trying to live out godly values in a world that's kind of opposite of it, in a world that we're not expecting or ready for it? It can feel uncomfortable, kind of like staying in a hot house for a week when you weren't expecting it, which leads me to my tweetable thought today. My tweetable thought today is this. Live out godly values while living in the world's culture. Live out godly values while living in the world's culture. See, here's the truth. We can't fix the world's problems in a day, but we can work on what God has put right in front of us. See, before we try to correct the world's problems, I just got to ask you a question. Are you working on your family's problems? Are you addressing the mess in your family? What does your family culture look like? See, this is where we find Lot and his family. Lot is the nephew of Abraham. Lot was a tent maker. He parted ways with Abraham and moved to the plain of Jordan where, where the Bible describes it looked, like the plan, it looked like the Garden of Eden. But the Bible also says near the plain of the Jordan was a wicked city named Sodom. Now I want to highlight three things that Lot and his family does that we should not do in order to live out godly values in the world's culture. But I also want to give you some godly values along the way too, okay? So point number one is this. Don't position your family in a negative culture. Don't position your family in a negative culture. Now, I'm not just talking about location. Location is a big deal and where your house and all that stuff is. But I'm talking about the location of your family culture. What is the, what is the family culture like? Now, Lot loved the Lord. He was blessed by God with servants and wealth. But Lot allowed the negativity of the world around him to influence his family. Now, before I continue with this, i got to say something. I don't believe Christians are supposed to be afraid of the world. I don't believe Christians are supposed to isolate themselves from the world. I believe the Bible makes it very clear that we're supposed to be in the world. We're supposed to be a part of the world. See, I think we are supposed to be highly involved in the world. Now, how do we live like Jesus in this world's culture, though? How do we bring out godly values in this world's culture that we see today? See, the good news is this. The good news is that our Bible is filled with four Gospels about how Jesus lived in the world's culture and how Jesus um, was able to bring godly values in the world's culture. And when you read about the stories of Jesus, the interesting thing is here, Jesus, far more looked, Jesus often looked more comfortable in secular environments 
than he did religious environments. Jesus had a way with talking to people who weren't connected to God, who were far from God, and bringing them closer to God. See, Jesus says this about us in regard to the world culture in John 17. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am not of the world. See, Christians often stop here. Oh, yeah, we ain't of the world. Mm-mm, don't put, we ain't of the world. Hey, how's your kids? How's your wife? The world coming for you, you know? <laughs> Hey, hey, don't you change that, Caleb, because it's positive and encouraging and we need that in my minivan right now. <laughs> don't change it. See, see, we're not supposed to be afraid of the world. Check out what Jesus says next. He says, my prayer is not, uh-oh, come on. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. See, Jesus' prayer to God hours before his crucifixion was that we would stay in the world. It is our job to stay in the world and bring godly values to the world. Jesus, before his ascension to heaven, tells his disciples, he gives them the great commission, which was to go out into the world. Not to stay isolated by yourself and just only do your Christian things, but to go out. And spread his love to the world to bring godly values. Now, from the evil one comes this Greek phrase that can also mean from evil. Jesus, in Jesus' prayer, he acknowledges that there is evil in the world. And the evil one, Satan, wants to destroy God's people while we bring godly values in the world. Jesus believed in two kingdoms. He believed in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And now when the Bible is talking about the kingdom of God, it can also be referred to as the kingdom of heaven. And it's not talking about a kingdom in a sense of taking land geographically, but kingdoms in the sense of having authority, of having rights. Jesus speaks that in this world there's an authority that comes from God while we're living in a world that has an authority from Satan. John Wimber, founder of the Vineyard Movement, said in his book, Power Evangelism, Jesus assumed that there is a power confrontation between the two kingdoms. Wherever he went, there was a confrontation with Satan, especially as he exercised his authority and power in teaching and healing. He sent the disciples out, sent us out, assuming that we would have similar conflicts, that we would have these issues. The problem with Lot was not Sodom. We give Sodom way too much credit for the issues that Lot experienced. The problem was that Lot gave up his godly authority to the world's culture. Now check this out. The wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah come to the Lord. He's ready to destroy the city because of his wickedness. And this is where we find Lot and his family. Genesis 19, starting in verse 1, it says, The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. Lot, once a successful tent maker, is now in fear at the front of the gate. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed, and bowed down with his face to the ground. My Lord, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered. We will spend the night at the, in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Two things I want you to grab here from this is this. He made bread without yeast, indicating that there is a haste and there's a panic to him. He's uncomfortable with where he's at. Second, men in that culture often did not cook. The absence of his wife's assistance gives us insight to the brokenness and disconnection of their marriage. Check out what happens next. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we, oh, shoot. Mm, this is getting awkward right now. Bring them out. Let me read that one more time. Let me underline it. Bring them out so that. Yeah, it says it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bring them out so that we can have sex with them. Mm -hmm. Woo! I told you this one was messy. 
this is a messy story today. See, this, uh, this here also indicates the wickedness of Solomon and Gomorrah. Check, Solomon, Sodom and Gomorrah. Check out the next part. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind them. Okay, yeah, Lot, Lot's about to stand up to this. He said, not today, not in my house. He's about to stand up to these people. He said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Come on. Look, I have two daughters. What? Mm -mm. <laughs> Hold on. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. That's, that's good. Okay. Let me bring them out to you. Woo. That ain't good. Mm -mm. And you can do what you like with them. He ain't winning father of the year. <laughs> no, mm -mm, not for him. <clears throat> Don't do these things. Don't do these things uh, for they come on the protection of my, move, of my roof. And you thought your family was messy. This one is real messy, isn't it? Lot would disregard for the safety of his daughters, offer them up to these brutal men. And it leads me back to the question I just asked, is the problem really Sodom? Is the problem really Sodom? Is the problem really the culture? And sometimes we can kind of get into this blame game too. We think to ourselves, oh man, it's in TV and they're poisoning the mind of our youths. Oh, it's all the rap music and that's why the black culture is like this. Oh, it's all these things going on and it's easy to blame the culture. But I got to ask you something. Is the problem the negative culture or is the problem the negative culture that you're allowing in your family? It's easy to blame our environments. It's easy to blame our culture. It's easy to cast blame on the things around us. But the Bible says this in 1 John 4, 4. It says, but you belong to God, my, my dear children. You have already won a victory over, these, over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit of the world. See, this verse is telling us, yes, there's a world culture around us, and the world's culture is going to speak and it's going to say something, but the Spirit of God is inside of you to stand stronger than the negativity of the world. This is, see, this, lot, this situation with Lot, it's extreme, but i got to ask you a question. What part of your family are you offering up to the world? Is it the constant fighting between you and your spouse? Is it the lack of consistency when disciplining your children? Is it working all the time and not spending intentional time with your family? Is it that work relationship that you know you need to cut off before it gets too late? Are you bringing in the kingdom of God or are you bringing in the kingdom of Satan? Are you bringing in the authority of God or allowing the authority of Satan to keep going? Now, how do we bring in the kingdom of God? Here's some things that I wrote down. By loving our families. By loving the church, loving others, doing good deeds, generosity with our finances, selflessness, prayer for our unsafe co-workers and friends and family members, inviting people to church, act of kindness to strangers. But this one's probably my favorite, act of kindness to loved ones who we often take for granted. Or are we okay with the kingdom of Satan? You may be like, Pastor Jacob, man, that sounds really intense how you keep saying that phrase. Like, of course, Satan, he's scary. No, we don't want that. Well, true. But remember, when I talk about these kingdoms, I'm talking about authority. Because sometimes you might be okay with the kingdom of Satan, the authority, and not even recognize it. So you might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if you see needs in the world, but you refuse to address them. You might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if you see problems and you post about them on your Facebook without, without having any attention to really do anything about it. You might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if you aren't spending time with your family. You might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if you're okay with conflict in your marriage and not resolving it. You might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if you don't share your relationship with Jesus beyond your small group. You might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if you come to the church expecting the church to meet your needs but not looking for ways for the, to serve the church. You might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if you consume yourself with religious ceremonies but don't apply them to your everyday life. You might be okay with the kingdom of Satan if someone cuts you off in the middle of the road and you flip them the bird with your K-Love sticker on the back of your minivan. See, I want you to see something here. I want you to see something. Satan's okay with you coming to church. He actually loves it. Because if you can come to church but don't live for the kingdom of God outside the church, he wins. 
See, Lot is in his house with his family, with two angels. He's in his house with the presence of God. But check out what he does next. He hears a loud bang from the world, even though, he has, even though he's with this family, with the presence of God. When the world makes a loud noise, he leaves his family, he leaves the presence of God, and he tries to handle it by himself. Sometimes the biggest mess that we get in our families is because we leave our family, we leave the presence of God, and we think we can fix it all by ourselves. Godly value number one is this, position your family towards Jesus no matter what. Position your family towards Jesus no matter what's going on. See, point one is this. Don't position your family in a negative culture. Instead, position your family towards Jesus no matter what. Point two today is this. Don't hesitate on what God is doing in your family. Don't hesitate on what God is doing in your family. Now the angels grab Lot and they pull him back into the house. They strike the men blind. All the men in front of the house, the angels strike them blind. And they're all looking like Stevie Wonder. You know, it's like, what's going on? And then the angels are like, hey, Lot, this place is bad. We got to go. We need to get out of here. God is about to destroy this place. And the angels ask him, is there anyone in the city you want to be saved? And Lot's like, yeah, there's these men. Pleasure to be married to my daughter. I really don't like them, but okay, I'll ask them. And so he goes to them. They're like, Lot, you're crazy. He's like, mm, joke's on you, buddy. <laughs> so, yeah, Lot goes back to the house. But check out this next part. Genesis 19, starting verse 15 says, With the coming of the dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When Lot hesitated. <laughs> What's he hesitating on? Now, sometimes you can read the Bible, and these little verses come up, and they pop up, and sometimes we just read right over them. But this one, this one's important. This one is important to, to spend some time on. When Lot hesitated. Other translations say when Lot lingered. Eugene Peterson says it best in the Message Bible, when Lot dragged his feet. He's in this horrible city. He's lost everything he worked for. There's men trying to bust into his house, abuse him, his wife, his daughters, and these angels. He has two angels saying to him, we got to get out of here. We need to leave this place. This is no good. We got to get away from here. And he still hesitates. Now the word hesitate means the word hesitate means pause before saying or doing something, especially through uncertainty. What's he uncertain of? What is Lot uncertain of? And I think the reason why we hesitate, or the reason why he hesitates, is because Lot actually doesn't believe God has his best interest in mind. If I can just live with, with one foot in the church, but one foot in the world, if the church thing doesn't work out, at least I didn't bet it all on the church. At least I didn't bet it all on God. And I thought about getting the help I needed, but I, but I was uncertain if it would work. I hesitated. I knew my kids were falling apart, but I was uncertain if I could really do anything, if I could really connect with them. I, I hesitated. I knew my spouse was unhappy. I hesitated. I knew I needed financial help, but I hesitated. I knew I needed to go back to school and, get, and, and, and go after the dreams that God has put in my heart, but I hesitated. I dragged my feet. Lot needs to get his family out of this situation, but he hesitates. Friends, what are we hesitating on? What are we waiting for? What is God speaking to you, but you keep hesitating? Don't we find ourselves sometimes saying a bunch of things that we want to do, but we don't do them? Don't we find ourselves saying, I'm never going to be in this place again, but we end up being there the next day? And I think it's because we actually don't believe God has the best for us. I deserve this addiction. I deserve this heartbreak. I deserve for my family to be like this. I deserve what I'm doing right now. I can't get from this. Jesus tells us this parable in Luke's gospel about the love of God when we are lost in our hesitations to move forward, 
Check this out. Luke 15, starting in verse 1, says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. See, if you heard Jesus say this story in that day, your mind would be blown. It was common during a long transportation of sheep that many sheep will wander away from the flock. So when he says, if one leaves, doesn't he leave the rest and find it? The common answer was like, uh, no, of course not. If, if, a, if a shepherd would let a few get away to protect the many. I want you to know this about Jesus today. Jesus in your moments of lostness, Jesus in your moments of hesitation on living out the purpose he has for your life, Jesus goes after you. Jesus chases you. When you wander off on your own decisions, Jesus is not back saying to himself, oh, he deserves to be lost. She deserves to be in that situation. Jesus, with his powerful grace, chases you. He finds you. He goes after you. And we know this because the love that was displayed on the cross for the Bible declares while we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. While we were far from him, he still loved us. Jesus chases you because you are worth it. You're worth it today, friends. He doesn't want you to stay in your hesitation. Check out the character of God that is demonstrated in the angels to Lot. When Lot hesitated, the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. The Lord was merciful. He was merciful to them. Even when we hesitate, the grace of God grabs us and says, I can't let you stay here. I got to move you forward. I'll give you everything your actions don't deserve. The angels bring them out of the city. The destruction of the Lord is about to come down. Godly value number two is this, trust in God even in uncertain times. Trust in God even in uncertain times. Point one today is this, don't position your family in a negative culture. Instead, position your family towards Jesus no matter what. Point two was don't hesitate on what God is doing in your life, but trust in God even in uncertain times. My third and my final point today is this, don't pass down a bad legacy. Don't pass down a bad legacy. Now they are free, saved by God, and we're ready for our happy ending, right? We're ready to see what's going to happen next to the family of Lot. But even though the angels saved Lot and his family, Lot doesn't move forward in that grace. The angels tell them to flee and go on the mountaintop for safety. Lot argues with them and asks if he can stay in the valley. The valley? See, sometimes when our faith is disconnected from God, even though God is trying to move us to the mountaintops of life, we'll stay in the valley. God is offering him the mountaintop, but he settles for the valleys. And on this path, the Bible says this very interesting verse, <laughs> Genesis 19 concludes this, says this. It says, by the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now often I thought she turns and looks back, and she becomes a literal pillar of salt, you know, like the salt I put on my popcorn. <laughs> but to look back meant that she went back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though there was destruction going down in the city, she abandoned her fit family and died in the burning. And now you thought your family was messy. And when you thought this story couldn't get any messier, oh, but it does. Genesis concludes 
this story this way. His daughter sought God, destroyed the entire earth, and that they were, and that everyone was left. Check this out. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight, and you go in and sleep, and sleep with him so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also. The younger daughter went in and slept with them. Again, Lot was not aware of it when she lied down and when she got up. Both of, so both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. And he is the father of the, Moab, the Moabites of today. Families. Well, families are messy, aren't they? Families can get real messy. And I know Lot's story is very extreme, but I think there's pieces to this story that we all can relate to. Especially at this end part where he's in a cave with his daughters and his daughters do this heinous thing and Lot has to ask himself, what legacy did I pass down? What did I teach? What did I give to the next generation? And here's the thing about legacy. Legacy does not start when you're dead and gone. Your legacy starts today. You may be in here, you're thinking, Pastor Jacob, man, I... I made some decisions that I wish I didn't do. I hurt some of the people I love the most. I want you to know something today. God is not a God of a plan B. But God is the God of a new plan A. There's still hope for your legacy. There's still hope. If you got breath in your lungs, then God's not done with you. And you can still change the legacy. And the reason why we know this is because my third godly value today is this. Godly value number three. God takes our mess and makes a message. God takes our mess and makes a message. Now the New Testament, by, the New Testament says in regards to Lot, in 2 Peter 4, starting in verse 6, it says, Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man. This bothers me. Because how are you going to say Lot was a righteous man? How does the Bible conclude that Lot, that Lot is righteous? who was so sick of the shameful morality of the wicked people around him, yes, Lot, who was a righteous man. I just, he was righteous? But he didn't take care of his family. He disregarded his daughters. His wife didn't respect him. He lost everything that he had. He positioned himself in a bad place. How was he righteous? See, if you read Genesis 18... The chapter before, Abraham, his uncle, stands before the Lord and asks God for mercy for the righteous people in the city of Sodom. Genesis 18.32 says this, Then Abraham said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. If only ten righteous can be found there, will you save them? God answered, For the sake of ten, I will save them. We see that Abraham stands in the gap for Lot and his family. And in Abraham's love for his nephew Lot, we see a foreshadowing of how Jesus stands in the gap for us. Jesus stood in the gap while we were lost in our sin, while we were lost in our mistake, and we couldn't reach the perfection of God. Jesus says, I'll stand in the gap, and I'll intercede for them, and I will bring them from their sinful state so they can be righteous before God and be in the presence of God. See, friends, your righteousness is not based on anything that you do, but it's based on everything that Jesus has done. Even in our biggest mess, because of Jesus, God can take our mess and make a message. Lot was righteous, not based on what he has done or what he did, but because God is so good. See, if you even 
if you stop there in this story, you read, he's like, man, this was kind of sad. But if you continue to read the Bible, we, get, we begin to understand this. Lot's daughter gives birth to Moab. But you remember that story I read in the beginning? When we, we see in the book of Ruth, Ruth is a Moabite. She marries a Hebrew named Boaz. And although she came from the pagan background and Moab, who was in the line of Lot, once she met the God of Israel, Ruth became a living testimony to him by faith. Ruth is one of the only three women mentioned in the gene genealogy of Jesus Christ. See, even from the mess Lot made, even though Lot was a mess up in a lot of ways, it was from his line that came King David, and from King David came the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I want you to know today, your family may be in a mess. There may be some issues going on, but God can still take your mess and point it back to Jesus. It's not done with God. His grace keeps going. His grace keeps pouring. And even though we make mistakes, your mistakes can't disqualify the presence of God. Your mistakes just bring up the calling that you're in need of a Savior that's always for you, that's never changing, that's always loving. That grace pours out on and on and on. God. Is the master, and I'm glad he is. He's the master at taking our mess and making a message. Don't you let your mess die. But you take what you learn from your mess and turn that thing around and, and teach a message that will change this world. There's hope for a new beginning today. Because the world thought it gained authority over us. But Jesus said, here I am, the time is now. I bring the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is now in his authority. Oh, the kingdom of Satan has to back down to it. Live out godly values while living in the world's culture. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, we thank you. God, we thank you for your love. God, we thank you for your goodness. I even feel right now, when I talked about legacy, there's a heavy burden that came in on a lot of people. And you thought to yourself, my legacy, I messed up. I already hurt too many people. My family, they're not even talking to me right now. And I feel like the Lord is saying, he's not done with you yet. I feel like the Lord is saying, don't count yourself out because he hasn't counted you out. You still have hope. And where there is hope, hope does not disappoint. I even feel there's people in here who keep hesitating on what God is doing in your heart. And you keep hesitating, keep dragging your feet because you're scared of the unknown. You're afraid of what might be. And even like the song we sung earlier today, God wants to take you to places deeper than what you ever thought. And I feel like the Lord is saying, Pick up your feet and start walking because where you are right now, you can't be anymore. Don't hesitate. No more hesitation. And, I'll, mm -hmm. and then I feel there's a lot of arguments going on in some households. And I specifically feel there's young kids watching the arguments Yep, and it's time to stop. It's time to cut that. Yep, it's time to cut that line. That, that was something that you were used to growing up with. That was something your spouse may have even been used to growing up. And the Lord is saying, stop it. Stop that right now. And I pray peace over that family. She may be in here today and you're like, Pastor Jacob, I don't know this Jesus you're talking about. 
I don't know this God you're talking about, but I want to know him. If you're in here today and you never made a decision to trust Jesus with your life, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you stand up or come up front, nothing like that. But right where you are in your chair, you can repeat this prayer after me. You can say it out loud or you can say it in your heart. If you want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life, repeat this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, forgive me for my mistakes. Make me new. Clean up my mess. Today I trust you. Today I follow you with my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's give God some praise in here. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.